Hello lovers of literature. Today, one of the most acclaimed Indian English writer is what we are going to do in our video. Who, have, who haven't heard of R.K. Narayan and his famous Malgundis? We all have at least once heard of the famous series of Malgudi days, which was even the most pop, even the most popular TV show in the 90s. Most of you who are just studying in school right now does not have access to Malgudi days, but I highly recommend that if possible, just download those and watch it. It's one of the biggest feasts that you can see in this series of Malgudi days. It has the perfect mixture of nostalgia with the Indian rural life portrayed vividly by our author R.K. Narayan. We will not be studying Malgudi days, which is unfortunate, but we are going to take up one of the quite famous story written by R.K. Narayan who has written more than 14 novels and uncountable short stories. This story was first published in Madras Indian newspaper The Hindu in 1916. It did not achieve a wide international audience until 1917 when it became the title story of Arkin Arayan's seventh collection of short stories. It reached an even wider audience in 1985 when it included when it was included in Under the Banyan Tree. Narayanan's tenth and best-selling collection, so that was it was incorporated there too. By this time, Narayan was well established as one of the most prominent authors writing in English in the 20th century. The story, Orson Tilgoats presents a comic dialogue between Muni, a poor Tamil-speaking villager and a wealthy English-speaking businessman from New York. They are engaged in a conversation in which neither can understand the other's language. With gentle humor, Narayan explores the conflicts between the rich and the poor and between Indian and Western culture. Narayan is best known for his 14 novels that I have already told you, many of which take place in the fictional town of Malgudi. Many of his stories in his 13th Short story collections also take place in Malgudi, but A Horse and Two Goats does not. This accounts for the fact that the story has attracted very little critical commentary. However, all of the attention it has drawn has been positive. The story is seen as a fine example of Narayan's dexterity in creating engaging characters and humorous dialogue, but it is not considered to be one of his greatest works. So this is a little bit of background of the story that we will be reading in depth, that is Horse and Two Goats. So as I told you, the story is not set in Malgadi, it is set in Kritam which is considered to be the tiniest of India's 700,000 villages, which opens with a clear picture of poverty in which the protagonist Muni lives. Of the 30 houses in the village, only one big house is made of brick. The others, including Muni's, are made of bamboo thatch, straw, mud and other unspecified materials. There is no running water and no electricity. Muni's wife, sorry, Muni's wife 
cooks the typical breakfast of a handful of millet flour over a fire in a mud pot. On this day, Muni has shaken down six drumsticks. What is drumstick? A local name for a type of radish. From the drumstick tree growing in front of his house and asks his wife to prepare them for him in a sauce or in a dip. She agrees provided he can get the other ingredients, none of which they have in the house. That is rice, dal, that is lentils, spices, oil and a potato. So these are the basic things that she needs to cook it. Muni and his wife have not always been so poor. Once, when he considered himself prosperous, he had a flock of 40 sheep and goats, which he would lead out to graze every day. But life has not been kind to him or to his flocks. Years of drought, a great famine, and an epidemic, sorry, epidemic, extremely sorry, epidemic that ran through Muni's flock have taken their toll. And as a member of the lowest of Indian castes, Muni was never permitted to go to school to learn or trade. Now he is reduced to two goats, two scrawny, to sell or to eat. He and his wife have no children to help them in their old age. So their only income is from the odd jobs his wife occasionally takes on at the big house. Muni has exhausted his credit at every shop in the town and today when he asks a local shop man to give him the items his wife requires to cook the drumsticks, he is sent away humiliated. There is no other food in the house so Muni's wife sends him away with the goats and tells him fast till the evening she tells him. It will do you good when he takes the goats to their usual spot a few miles away, a grassy area near the highway, where he can sit in the shade of a life-sized statue of a horse and a warrior and watch trucks passes by. The statue is made of weather-bitten clay and has stood in the same spot for all of Muni's 70 or more years. So this is the backdrop of the statue, which is, which is very important because the title of the story derives its name from the statue, a horse, and of course the horse is the horse statue, and two goats that belongs to Muni, which I have already told you of, and they're too scrawny. As Muni watches the road, and waits for the appropriate time to return home, contemplating that his wife would bring him food by evening. He notices a yellow station wagon comes down the road and pulls over. A red faced American man dressed in khaki clothing gets out and is asking Muni where to find the nearest gas station. When he notices the statue, which he finds marvelous and the quotes. When his first impulse is to run away, assuming from the khaki that this foreigner must be a policeman or a soldier. But Muni is too old to run anymore and he cannot leave the goats. They do begin to converse if conversation can be used to describe what happens when two people speak to each other in a completely different language, not being able to understand what the other is speaking of. Now the man addresses Muni as Namaste, how do you do? This is a greeting and Muni responds only the English words yes. The American a businessman from New York City lights a cigarette and offers one to Muni, who knows about cigarettes but has never had one before. He offers Muni his business card, but Muni fears it is a warrant of some kind. 
when he launches into a long explanation of his innocence of what type of crime the man is investigating. And the American asks questions about the horse statue, which he would like to buy. He tells Muni about a bad day at work, when he was forced to walk for four hours without elevators of electricity, and seems completely unaware that Muni lives this way every day. But now he is convinced that Muni is the owner of the statue which he is determined to buy. The two talk back and forth each about his own life. Muni remembers his father and grandfather telling about the statue and the ancient story it depicts and tries to explain how old it is. I get a kick out of every word you utter, the American replies because he cannot understand. Muni reminisces about his difficult and impoverished childhood working in the fields and the America laughs heartily. Muni interprets the statue and tells that this is our guardian, the horse. At the end of Kali Yuga, this world and all other worlds will be destroyed and the redeemer that is the horse in the form of redeemer will come in the shape of a horse. The American replies, I assure you, this will have the best home in USA. So both are talking in complete different notes. One is materialistic in its approach and other is spiritual or Indian or with the notion of culture, religion that belonged completely to the East. I assure you, this will have the best home in the USA. I will push away the bookcase. The TV may have to be shifted. I don't see how that can interfere with the party. We will stand around him and have our drinks. It is clear that even if the two could understand each other's words, they could not understand each other's words, which is very important. Both of them belonged to two different worlds. One is the world of spirituality, culture, religion, belief, faith, and the other from a material, from a more modern approach of Western civilization. Finally, the American pushes 100 rupees into Muni's hand, 20 times Muni's debt with the shopkeeper. He considers that he has bought the horse and Muni believes he has just sold his coats. Muni runs home to present the money to his wife when the American flags down a truck, gets help breaking the horse off its pedestal and drives away with his purchase. Muni's wife does not believe her husband's story about where the money came from and her suspicions only increase when the goats find their way home. So the goats return back and Muni's wife tells him that if you have thieves or you have been a part of any conspiracy, then believe me, I am not going to support you. This shows the honesty of Muni's wife. As the story ends, she is shrieking at him and Muni appears to be not much better off than he was at the start. So we have the main characters, American, we have Muni. So the American comes from Connecticut. He's dressed in the khaki clothing worn by American tourists in the tropics. He typifies the ugly American. He speaks only English, but is surprised and a little annoyed to find that Muni can speak only Tamil. And although he's the tiniest village in India, he expects to find a gas station and English-speaking goat herds, which is completely surprising. Once he sees the statue of the horse, he must own it for his living room with no thought for what the statue might mean or who may value it. Even when he can't speak the language, he knows that money talks. That's why he gives away the money. So it shows that he is a money-minded businessman hailed from New York 
who expects everyone to know English and there should be a gas station even in the tiniest village of India. Muni is the main protagonist of the story, who is an old and desperately poor man. Once he was prosperous with a large flock of sheep, but a series of misfortunes have left him with only two scrawny goats. He and his wife have almost no income and no children to help take care of them. Every day Muni takes the goats out to graze on the scarce grass outside the town. While his wife pulls something together for an evening meal. As he watches the goats from the shade of a large statue, he remembers his younger days when the work was hard but there was enough to eat when he could not attend school because he was not of the right caste and when he imagined that he would one day have children. Like many poor and struggling people, he fears authority figures. So he fears the American who steps out of a strange car wearing khaki clothes. While the man tries to talk with him about the statue, Mooney babbles on about a recent murder and the end of the world. At the end he seems to have temporarily escaped his money troubles but his bad luck continues when his wife suspects him of thievery and threatens to leave. Now the shop man is a moody man who has given Muni food on credit in the past but who has been pushed past his limits. Muni owes him five rupees and although they share a bit of humorous conversation, the shop man will not give him any more. So this is the character of the shop man. He is a moody man. Sometimes he gives food to Muni on credit. But of course, now he tells that Muni already owes five rupees and they share a bit of humorous conversation where Muni is caught at by the shop man but he does not give him the required materials. Now comes Muni's wife, who is one of the most important supporting characters in the story. She has spent some 60 years with him. Neither of them is sure about their ages. They have got married when they were just little children and they have survived through prosperity and poverty. Although she is gruff with him now, she is willing to indulge his request for a special meal. She works as hard as he does, or harder, getting up at dawn to fix his morning meal and taking odd jobs at the only cement house or the uh, pakka house in the village that is also known as the big house. But poverty has worn her down. Her first reaction when she, when she sees the hundred rupees is to accuse Muni and tell him that you better take care if you've stolen the money, which shows that she is one of the most honest character in one of the most on, honest characters in the story. Now, after having gone through a detailed analysis of the characters, let us get into the themes. The most important theme, as I've told you, in Horse and Two Goats, in fact, the central theme of Narayan's work is the clash of cultures, specifically the clash of Indian and Western cultures. Using humor instead of anger, Narayan demonstrates just how far apart the two worlds are. The two cultures exist in the same time and space but literally and metaphorically speak different languages. The two ma main characters in the story couldn't be more different. Muni is poor, rural, uneducated, Hindu, brown. The American is wealthy, armed, educated, probably Judeo-Christian, white. As a good Hindu, Muni calmly accepts the hand that fate has dealt him. When the American is willing and able to take drastic and sudden action to change his life, 
For example, flying off to India or throwing away his return plane ticket to transport a horse statue home on a ship. Each man is quite ignorant of the other's way of life. Unlike many stories about culture clash, the inability to communicate with a story leads to confusion, but it does not harm because it is covered with humor. In fact, although each feels vaguely dissatisfied with the conversation, the men do not realize that they are not communicating. Each speaks a claim about his own life and local calamities with no awareness that the other hears nothing. At the end of their encounter, each man has what he wants or needs, and neither man has lost anything of value. As an Indian who writes only in English, Narayan himself has experienced the ways in which Indian and Western cultures conflict. While this conflict may be painful at times, here he finds it really amusing. Another theme which is very important is wealth and poverty. Although these two people, that is the American and Muni, has very little in common, the most important way in which Muni and the American differ is their respective level of wealth. Narayan takes great pains in opening the story to show how desperately poor Muni is and to emphasize that even <coughs> excuse me that even in his time of prosperity his standard of living was still greatly below that of most of the Americans. The American takes for granted his relative wealth but seems unaware of the difference between Muni and himself. He casually offers cigarettes to a man who has never seen one complains about four hours without air conditioning to a man who has never had electricity, brags about enjoying manual labor as a Sunday hobby to a man who grew up walking in the fields from morning until night, and without a thought gives Muni enough money to open a business. He is not trying to show off, he simply accepts his wealth as his right. He is very casualness and emphasizes the gap between them. Narayan in any way, sorry, in no way contempts the man for being wealthy and Muni for being who he is. It is just that he has shown us the different thought processes. Horse and Two Goats explores the main theme, one of the main major theme, that is knowledge and ignorance in the story. It, uh, it, it explores the different ways that a person can be educated. Muni, grew, Muni who grew up a member of a lower caste at the time when only the Brahmin, a higher caste, could attend school has no formal education. He has not travelled beyond his village and he likes to watch trucks and buses go by on the highway a few miles away so that he can have a sense of belonging to a larger world. He does not even know his own age. He does, however, have an impressive amount of knowledge of the two major texts of his literary heritage, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which he has learned by acting in plays and by listening to speakers in the temple. He knows the stories and he is able to mine them for truth and wisdom when he needs them. The American, on the other hand, has the full benefits of an American education. He has a room full of books that he values as objects. Because he tells, you know, I love books and I'm a member of five books, book clubs, and the choice and bonus volumes mount up to a pile in our living room. There is no evidence that he understands or values what is inside them. On one level, he is familiar with the larger world around him in a way that Muni never will be. However, even on this trip to India to look at other civilizations, he does not seem to be looking at India for what it is, 
but only for a reflection of an ornament for his old life. Tabujikated Muni tries to tell him the significance of the horse statue, but the American sees it only as a living room decoration. Of course, the language barrier prevents him from receiving Muni's interpretation, but it never even crosses his mind to ask. In the story, there are two, at least two ways to be ignorant. One is not knowing, and another is the cultural. One is not knowing the cultural differences, and the other is not knowing the language. So, from the style point of view, Horse and Two Goats is narrated in a third person viewpoint by an omniscient narrator who reports clearly and objectively on the characters, words, actions, memories, but who does not comment or judge. The narrator describes Cretum's erosion and Muni's decline dispassionately, without regret conversation between Muni and his wife, or Muni and the shopman are told from Muni's perspective, but with his calm acceptance of whatever fate brings him. The restraint is important to understand the humor of the dialogue between Muni and American. Narayan trusts the readers to interpret the absurd conversation without his having to say through his narrator. So he does that just to make us know that two people belong to completely different cultures with their own human fallibilities and they are not to be interpreted, judged, but they are to be looked at with compassion, sympathy. Now the setting of the story. The setting takes place in Kritam, probably the tiniest of India's several hundred thousand villages. Its four streets aligned with about 30 mud and thatch huts and one big house made of brick and cement. Women cook in clay pots over clay stoves and the huts have no running water or electricity. A few miles away, down a rough dirt track through dye fields of cactus and lantana bushes is a highway leading to the mountains, where a large construction project is being completed. The meeting between Muni and the red-faced American was intended to take place between about 1945 when televisions became generally available to Americans and 1960 when the story was published. So that was to be the time period. Realism is one of the major traits of the story. What is that? All the time we have noted that Narayan is specifically known for his simple, accurate presentation of common everyday life as it is linked by identifiable characters. In our horse and two goats, Narayan pays careful attention to the small details of Muni's life. Where he lives, he eats, how he cuts, he smokes, his first cigarettes. Although many of the small details like the drumstick tree and the dhoti where Muni puts his hundred rupees are particularly Indian, but they are also basic enough to human experience and they are easily understood by an international audience. Narayan's characters and stories are read not so much as regional literature, but as universal. Now, humor is an important element in horse tickles, and understanding Narayan's humor is important to understanding his worldview. Humor which is sim affectionate, sympathetic to humanity and human foibles is often distinguished from wit, which looks more harshly on human fallibility. So here it is not that kind of a humor. For Narayan, who looks at the world through the lens of his Hindu faith, weakness and strife are to be accepted, transcended and not to be railed against. When he creates the comic characters of Muni and the American, he laughs at them gently, kindly, but not critically. So having said that, let us get into the story, which is a rather long story. But 
as I've already told you, Narayan's style is very simple. So the story, the narrative is not difficult at all. Of the 700,000 villagers dotting the map of India, Krita was probably the tiniest. Indicated on the drastic survey map by a microscopic dot, but its size did not prevent its giving itself the grandiose name Pritam, which meant in Tamil coronet or crown on the brow of the subcontinent. The village consisted of less than 30 houses, only one of them built to break and cement painted a brilliant yellow and blue all over with gorgeous carvings of gods and gargoyles on its balustrade. It was known as the big house. The other houses distributed in four streets were generally of bamboo thatch, straw, mud and other unspecified material so it gives us a picture of the poverty sticking village of the tiniest Stature. Muniz was the last house in the fourth street beyond which stretched the fields. In his prosperous days, Muni had owned a flock of 40 sheep and goats and sallied forth every morning, driving the flock to the highway a couple of miles away. There he would sit on the pedestal of a clay statue of a horse while his cattle grazed around. He carried a crook at the end of a bamboo pole and snapped foliage from the avenue, tried to feed his flock. He also gathered faggots and dry sticks, bundled them, carried them home for fuel at sunset. So this is his regular duty of carrying cattle and snapping foliage, feeding his flock, gathering faggots, dry sticks and to carry them home for fuel at sunset. A typical Indian rural village, rural setting picture that we get here. Completely village, a complete village with all the same essence that any other Indian village would have. His wife lit the domestic fire at dawn, boiled water in a mud pot threw it into a handful of millet flour, added salt and gave him his first nourishment for the day. When he started out, she put in his hands a packed lunch. Once again, the same millet cooked into a little ball, which he could swallow with a raw onion at midday. His fortunes had declined gradually unnoticed from a flock of forty which drove into a pen at night. His stock had now come down to the two goats which were tethered to the trunk of a drunk stick tree which grew in front of his hut and from which occasionally Muni could shake down drum sticks. This morning he got six, he carried them in with a sense of triumph, the victory of getting six drum sticks, that is how simple the man is. Although no one could say precisely who owned the tree, it was because he lived in its shadow. His wife said, if you were content with the drumstick leaves alone, I could boil and salt some for you. Oh, I'm tired of eating those leaves. I pray you to chew the drumstick out of sauce, I tell you. You have only four teeth in your jaw, but your craving is for big things. All right, get the stuff for the sauce, and I will prepare it for you. After all, next year you may not be alive to ask for anything. But first, get me all the stuff, including a measure of rice or millet, and I will satisfy your unholy craving. Unholy? Because this is not the craving you should have for his age. Our store is empty today. Dal, chili, curry leaves, mustard, coriander, ginger oil, and one large potato. Go out and get all this, he repeated the list after her, in order not to miss any item, and walked off to the shop in the third street. Muni sat patiently on an upturned packing case below the platform of the shop. The shopman paid no attention to him. Muni kept clearing his throat trying to gain attention. 
huffing, sneezing, until the shop man could not stand it any more and demanded, What ails you? You will fly off that seat into the gutter if you sneeze so hard, young man. So he's just making fun of Muni. Muni laughed inordinately as if he had said something extraordinary in order to please the shop man and be called young man. This completely owned the shop man over. He liked a sense of humor to be appreciated. By thus humoring the shop man, Muni could always ask for one or two items of food promising repayment later. So this is how he has most of the time done. But today he will not get that. Some days the shop man was in a good mood so we know that he is a moody man and gave in. And sometimes he would lose his temper suddenly and bark at Woody for daring to ask for credit. The shop man said, if you could find five rupees and a quarter, you will have paid off an ancient debt so you already owe that much of money. How much have you got now? I will pay you everything but the first of the next month. As always, and whom do you accept to rob by then? Muni felt caught and muffled. My daughter has sent word that she will be sending me money. Have you a daughter? sneered the shop man. So this is a complete lie. He's imagining things. Is she is sending you money? For what purpose may I know? Birthday. Fiftieth birthday. Now Muni, Muni, sorry, Muni imagines that he is just 50, which is not the case. Said so Muni quietly, birthday, how old are you? Muni repeatedly, repeated weekly, not being sure of it himself, 50. He always calculated his age. Now this is the ignorance that is shown of his age, even the age. So that is how the ignorant, the rural people marry. He just calculated his age from the time of the great famine when he stood as high as the parapet. So he was that small. As around the village well. But who could calculate such things accurately nowadays with so many famine talkery? The shopman felt encouraged when other customers stood around to watch and comment. More likely, you are 70, he said to the you also forget that you mentioned a birthday five weeks ago. So he's already mentioned birthday. When you wanted castor oil for your holy birth. Holy bath. At this morning, unobtrusively rose and moved off. But just got up and moved off. He later told his wife, this crowded would not give me anything. So go out. Sell the drumsticks for what they are worth. He flung himself down in a corner to recoup from the fatigue of his visit to the shop. His wife said, you are getting no sauce today nor anything else. I can't find anything to give you to eat. Fast in the evening. It will do you good. Take the coats and be gone now. So he had to go without any coat. So that is the miserable condition of this man. She cried and added, don't come back before the sun is down. She cried and added, don't come back before the sun is down. He knew that if he obeyed her, she would somehow conjure up some good food for him. So it shows that Muni is not the boss of the house, but rather the wife. Why? Because she is the one who earns money. Only he must be careful not to argue and irritate her. Her temper was undependable in the morning, but improved by evening time. She was sure to go out and walk, grind, but grinds corn in the big house. So these are the different things that she does in the big house. This is important. Sweep or scrub somewhere and earn enough to buy food stuff and keep a dinner ready for him in the evening. Unleashing the goats from the drumstick tree, when he started out driving them ahead and uttering weird cries from time to time in order to urge them on. He passed through the village with his head bowed in thought. He did not want to look at anyone or be accosted. A couple of cronies lounging in the temple corridor hailed him and scolded him, but he ignored their call. The shopman had said he was 70. 70? One only one waited to be summoned by God instead. 
when he was dead what would his wife do they had lived so that shows that he loves his wife so much they had lived in each other's company since they were children he had been told on the day of wedding that he was 10 years old and she was 8 progeny none so she has no children so perhaps muni is imagining about a daughter which he has not begotten from his wife Perhaps a large progeny would have brought him the blessings of God. So he wishes, and this is the superstitious element that we find in the story. And he wishes maybe a good progeny would seek them blessings from the God. Only on the outskirts he lift his head and look up. He urged and bullied the goats until they meandered along to the foot of the horse. Statue on the edge of the village. He sat on its pedestal for the rest of the day. The advantage of this was that he could watch the highway and see the lorries and buses pass through to the hills. So he spent his day by looking at everything around him. And it gave him a sense of belonging to a larger world, as if he felt that he was connected to a larger world because he had no escape from his tiny village, which the American can, but we cannot because it's died there for his ill luck and what is that ill luck because he does not have money enough the pedestal of the statue was broad enough for him to move around as the sun traveled by and westward or he could also crouch under the belly of the horse for shade the horse was nearly life-size molded out of clay pecked burnt brightly colored reared its head proudly. So this is this description is of the horse which is a warrior, the, uh, carrying a warrior and it is a war horse, prancing its four legs in the air, flourishing its tail in a loop. Beside the horse stood the, uh, a warrior with a sky-like mustachio, which is this kind of mustachio, which is that shape, bulging eyes, aquiline nose, straight nose. The horse itself was said to have been as white as a dhobi washed sheet and had had on its back a cover of pure brocket of red and black lace, matching the multicolored sash around the waist of the warrior. But none in the village remember the splendor as one noticed its existence. No one knows of what made the glorified statue to be there. Even Muni, who spent all his waking hours at its foot, never bothered to look up. It was untouched even by the young vandals or the people who were accustomed to crime of the village who gashed tree trunks with knives and tried to topple off milestones and inscribe new designs on all walls. The statue had been closer to the population of the village at one time when the spot bordered the village. Muni sat at the foot of the statue watching his two goats graze in arid soil among the cactus and the lantana bushes. He looked at the sun, it tilted westward, no doubt, but it was not the time yet to go back home. If he went too early, his wife would have no food for him. Also, he must give her time to cool off her temper and feel sympathetic. And then she would scrounge and manage to get some food. So Muni knows it is not yet time. And so he is waiting out there so that he could get some food from his wife. He noticed now a new sort of vehicle coming down at full speed. It looked like both a motor car and a bus. He used to be intrigued by the novelty of such spectacles. But of late, work was going on at the source of the river, so this is the construction going on. On the mountain, an assortment of people and traffic went past him. Assortment means different kinds of. And he took it all casually and described to his wife later in the day everything he saw. Today, when he observed the yellow up, just excuse me for some seconds because does not have the pages. Okay, I got it, sorry. I thought I lost it. Today while he just, just, just give me a sec. Yeah. He observed the yellow vehicle coming down. He was wondering how to describe it later to his wife when it sputtered and stopped in front of him. A red-faced foreigner who had been driving it got down and went round it, stooping, looking, poking 
under the vehicle. Something wrong with the vehicle. Then he straightened himself up, looked at the dashboard, stared in one direction and approached him. Excuse me, is there a gas station nearby? Or do I have to wait until another car comes? He suddenly looked up at the clay horse and cried, Fellas. Without completing his sentence, Muni felt he should get up and run away. Why? Because Muni talked to his bullets and cursed his age because he could not run. He could not readily put his leaves into action. The red faced man wore khaki clothes, evidently a policeman or a soldier. Muni said to himself, He will chase or shoot if I start running. Some dogs chase only those who run. Oh, Shiva, protect me. I don't know why this man should be after me. Meanwhile, the foreigner cried, Marvellous! Again nodding his head, he paced around the statue with his eyes fixed on it. Muni sat frozen for a while and then fidgeted and tried to age away. Now the other man suddenly pressed his palms together, smiled and said, Namaste, how do you do? At which Muni spoke the only English expressions he had learned, yes, no. So already the communication gap started. Having exhausted his English vocabulary, he started to tabel. My name is Tuni, is to go to mine. No one can get say it. The prince cannot take it away from me. Though our village is full of slanderers these days, that's criminals. Who will not hesitate to say that what belongs to a man does not belong to him? The foreigner faithfully looked in the direction indicated by Tuni's fingers, gazed for a while at the two goats and the rocks and with a puzzled expression, took out his silver cigarette case and lit a cigarette. Suddenly remembering the courtesies of the season, he asked, Do you smoke? When he answered, Yes, no, whereupon the red-faced man took a cigarette and gave it to Muni, who received it with surprise, having had no offer of a smoke from anyone for years now. He had always wanted to smoke a cigarette. Only once did the shop man give him one on credit and remembered how good it had tasted. The other flicked the lighter open and offered a light to Muni. Muni felt so confused about how to act that he blew on it and put it out. The other puzzled but undaunted flourished his lighter, presented it again and lit with a cigarette. So Muni was offered a cigarette which he wanted to deny but he could not. Muni drew a deep puff and started coughing. It was racking, no doubt, but extremely pleasant. When his cough subsided, he wiped his eyes and took stock of the situation, his control of the situation, understanding that the other man was not an inquisitor of any kind. Yet in order to make sure, he remained wary. No need to run away from a man who gave him such a potent smoke, this heavy smoke. American cigarettes made with roasted tobacco. The man said, I come from New York. He took out a wallet from his hip pocket and presented his card. Muni shrank away from the card. Perhaps he was trying to present a warrant and arrest him. Beware of khaki, one part of his mind warned. Take all the cigarettes or whatever is offered, but don't get caught. Beware of Kaki, he wished. He weren't 70 as the shopman had said. At 71, no one, at 70, one didn't run, but surrendered to whatever came, because he's preparing for death. He could only ward off trouble by talk. So he went on, all in chest tamil, for which Pritam was famous. He said, before God, sir, Bhagwan, who sees everything, I tell you, sir, that we know nothing of the case. If the murder was committed, whoever did, it will not escape. Bhagwan is all seen. It shows how God fearing Muni is and all agents are. Don't ask me about it. I know nothing. Body had been found mutilated and thrown under a tamarind tree at the border between Pritam and Kupam a few weeks before, giving rise to much gossip and speculation. Muni added an explanation. Anything is possible there. People over there will stop it. Nothing. The foreigner nodded his head and listened courteously, though he understood nothing. I am sure you know when this horse was met, said the red man, smiling ingratitudinally. 
Woody reacted to the relaxed atmosphere by smiling himself and pleaded, Please go away, sir. I do nothing. I promise we will hold him for you if we see any bad character around. So he tells that we will, of course, catch hold of the thief if we see any bad man around. Such a big story, my God, but it's easy. It's quite an easy story. And we will bury him to his neck in a coconut pit if he tries to escape. But our village always had a clean record. Must definitely be the other village. The victim must be from the other village. Now the red man requested or implored, please, please, I will speak slowly. Please try to understand me. Can't you understand even a simple word of English? So he hopes that everyone should know English. Everyone in this country seems to know English as if they're superior. So there is a kind of pervasive nature of this man who wants everyone to know English. I have gotten along with English everywhere in this country, but you don't speak it. Have you any religious or spiritual scruples against English speech? Is that you have any spiritual scruples against English speech and you cannot speak for that way? When he made some indistinct sounds in his throat and shook his head, encouraged, the other went on to explain at length, uttering each syllable with care and deliberation. Presently, he sidled over and took a seat beside the old man, explaining, You see, last August, we probably had the hottest summer in history, and I was working in shirt sleeves in my office on the 40th floor of the Empire State Building. We had a power failure one day, so it is as if never had power failure. So this is a complete clash of cultures, as I've told you. No elevator, no air conditioning, all the way in the train. I kept thinking. And the minute I reached home in Connecticut, I told my wife, oh, we will visit India this winter. It's time to look at other civilizations. Next day, she called the travel agent first thing and told him to fix it. And so here I am. So as if in a jiffy, they could travel the other part of the globe, which proves that he is a man of influence and money, which money is not. Ruth came with me, but is staying back at Srinagar, and I am the one doing the rounds and joining her letter. Woody looked reflective at the end of this long oration and said rather feebly, yes, no, at, as a concession to the other's language, and went on in Tamil. When I was this high, he indicated a foot high, I had heard my uncle say. Now he is continuously speaking something else. So there, this communication bridge makes us laugh. No one can tell what he was planning to say as other interrupted him at this stage to ask, Boy, what is the secret of your teeth? How old are you? When he forgot what he had started to say, and remarked, Sometimes we to lose our cattle, jackals or cheetahs will sometimes carry them off. But sometimes it is just theft from over in the next village and he brings out the character of the priest who bullies people and earns money. And then we will know who has done it. Our priest of the temple can see in the camp of flame the face of the thief. And when he is caught, he gestured with his hands a perfect mincing of meat like as if they are just cut down. The American washed his hands intently and said, I know what you mean, chop something? Maybe I'm holding you up and you want to chop wood? What's your ex? Hand it to me and show me what to chop. I do enjoy it, you know, just a hobby. We got a lot of driftwood along the backwater near my house. And on Sundays, I do nothing but chop wood for the fireplace. I really feel different when I watch the fire in the fireplace. Though it may take all the sections of the Sunday New York Times to get a fire started. And he smiles at this reference. So it's just telling about his daily life, or his movie is telling about his daily life. Just to portray in front of us the difference or the drift in both their cultures. Woody felt totally confused but decided the best thing would be to make an attempt to get away from the place. He tried to age out saying, must go home, he tried to go. The other seized his shoulder and said desperately, is there no one, absolutely no one here to translate for me? He looked up and down the road which was deserted in this hot afternoon. 
The stranger almost pinioned Mooney's back to the statue and asked, Isn't the statue yours? Why don't you sell it to me? The old man now understood the reference to the horse, thought for a second and said in his own language, I was an archer in the sky when I heard my grandfather explain this horse and warrior. And my grandfather mother himself, sorry, grandfather himself was this high when he heard his grandfather, whose grandfather. So everything that is conveyed in terms of education is conveyed through ears or through mouth. Nothing is formally education. Nothing is a formal education that is talked about here. The other man interrupted him. I don't want to see him to have stopped here. For nothing. I will offer you a good price for this, he said, indicating the horse. He had concluded without the least doubt that Mooney owed, owned this smart horse. Perhaps he gazed by the way he sat on its pedestal, like other souvenir sellers in this country, presiding over their wares. So he thought he must be just uh, sitting there just to sell his horse. The horse statue is his and he's standing there to sell it. So that's what he thought. Mooney followed the man's eyes and pointing fingers and dimly understood the subject matter and feeling relieved that the theme of the mutilated body had been abandoned at least for the time being. Said again enthusiastically, I was this high when my grandfather told me about this horse and the warrior and my grandfather was this high when he himself. The Tamil that Muni spoke was stimulating, even as pure sound. The foreigner listened with fascination. I wish I had my tape recorder here, he said, assuming the ple pleasantest expression. Your language sounds wonderful. I get a kick out of every word you utter here, he indicated his ears. But you don't have to waste your breath in self stop. I appreciate the article. You don't have to explain its points. So he tells, I don't want you to explain its points. I never want, went to a school in those days. Only the Brahmin. So it shows that he is not privileged to, to be a Brahmin. Went to schools, but we had to go out and walk in the fields. He talks about his childhood. Morning till night, from sowing to harvest time, and when Pongal came, we had cut the harvest. What is Pongal? It is one of the most popular festival of harvest in town south. My father allowed me to go out and play with others at the time, so I don't know the Ferengi language you speak. Even little fellows in your country probably speak the Ferengi language, that is English, but here only learned men and officers know it. The foreigner laughed heartily, took out another cigarette and offered it to Muni, who now smoked with ease, deciding to stay on if the fellow was going to be so good as to keep up the cigarette supply. So he was thoroughly impressed by it. The American now stood up on the pedestal in the attitude of a demonstrative lecture and said, lecturer and said, running his finger along some of the curved decorations around the horse's neck, speaking slowly and uttering his words syllable by syllable. I could give a self-stop for this better than anyone else, to, as if he is appreciating the beauty of the horse statue. This is a marvelous combination of yellow and indigo, the faded now. How do you people of this country achieve this flaming colors? Muni now assured that the subject was still the horse and not the dead body said, this is our guardian. So he wants to educate the foreigner on this concept of the two yugas moving away with a horse coming as a redeemer. It means death to our adversaries, it is death to our, all our problems. At the end of Kali Yuga, swords and all other worlds will be destroyed. And the redeemer will come in the shape of a horse called Kalki. The horse will come to life and gallop and trample down all that men. While he was brooding on this pleasant vision, the foreigner utilized the pause to say, I assure you that this will have the best home in the US. I will push away the bookcase, you know, I love books. I am a member of the five book clubs and the choice of the bonus volumes mount up to a pie really in our living room as high as this horse itself. So he talks about how he has 
so many books but actually maybe he has not read those books it's just for the sake he's having but they will have to go ruth may disapprove but i will convince when he continued his description at the end of the world our pundit discourse to the temple once how the oceans are going to close over the earth in a huge wave and swallow us this horse will grow bigger than the biggest wave and carry on its back only the good people kick into the floods the evil ones so as if the horse will judge throw away the evil people and only carry the good ones in the surge of the wave trying to save them plenty of them about he said reflectively Do you know when it is going to happen? He asked. The foreigner now understood by the tone of the other that a question was being asked and said, "I am not a millennial, but a modest businessman. My trade is coffee." Amidst all this wilderness of the obscure sound, Muni caught the word coffee and said, "If you want to drink coffee, drive farther up in the next town." They are Friday market. There they open coffee hotels. So I learned from Pastor Bites. So he is trying to bring some fun element again. Foreigner said, "I repeat, I am not a millennial. Ours is a modest business after all. We can't afford to buy more than sixty minutes of TV. That is the advertisement time in a month, which works out to two minutes a day. That's all. Although in the course of a time we will." We will maybe sponsor a one-hour show regularly if our sales graph continues to go up. Then the visitor, feeling that he had spent too much time, already said, "Tell me, will you accept a hundred rupees or not for the horse?" So he understood that he's running short of the time. He knows how to make people shut up by giving money. I would love to take that whiskered soldier also, but no space for him this year. I will have to cancel my air ticket and take a boat home. So it shows how privileged he is. I suppose Ruth can go by air if she likes, but I will go with the horse and keep him in my cabin all the way if necessary. And he smiled at the picture of himself voyaging across the seas, hugging the horse. He added, "I will have." to pad it with straw so that it does break i have my station wagon as you see i can push the seat back and take the horse in it if you will just lend me a hand with it lend me a hand and i can lift off the horse from its pedestal after picking out a cement at the joints we can do anything if we have a basis of understanding so this shows how proud he is he tells we can do anything if we just want to do with a proper understanding At this stage, the mutual mystification was complete, and there was no need even to carry on a guessing game at the meaning of words. The old man chattered away in a spirit of balancing of the credits and debits of conversational exchange, and said, "To be in order to be on the credit side, oh honourable one, I hope it's God has blessed you with numerous progeny. I say this because you seem to be a good man." Willing to stay beside an old man and talk to him, while all day I have none to talk to except when somebody stops by to ask for a piece of tobacco. But I seldom have it. Tobacco is not what it used to be at one time, and I have given up chewing. I cannot afford it nowadays. So again, he talks something out of the topic, whereas the foreigner wants to give him a hundred rupee note and end everything. Noting the other's interest in the speech. Muni felt encouraged to ask, "How many children do you have?" With appropriate gestures with his hands, realizing that the question was being asked, the rain man replied, "I said a hundred, not the hundred, not the hundred children that he has. He said hundred for hundred rupee, which encouraged Muni to go into the details. How many of your children are boys and how many girls? Where are they? Is your daughter married? Is it difficult to find a son-in-law in your country also?" In answer to these questions, the red man dashed his hand into his pocket and brought forth his wallet in order to take immediate advantage of the bearish trade in the market. He flourished a hundred rupee currency note and said, "Well, this is what I meant." The old man now realized that some financial element was entering their talk. He peered closely at the currency note. 
the like of which he had never seen in his life. He knew the five and ten by the colors of, although always in other people's hands, while his own army at any time was in coppers and nickels. What was this man flourishing the note for? What is it? What is the purpose? Perhaps asking for a change, he laughed to himself at the notion of anyone coming to him for changing a thousand or ten thousand rupee note. He said with a grin, Ask our village headman, who is also a money lender. He can change even a lakh of rupees in gold sovereigns if you prefer it that way. He thinks nobody knows, but dig the floor of his puja room and your head will be green at the sight of the hood. So we were talking about how the man hides his money and his wealth under the floor of his puja room. The man disguises himself in rags just to mislead the public. Talk to the headman yourself because he goes mad at the sight of me. Someone took away his pumpkins with a creeper and he for some reason thinks it was me and my goats. That's why I never let my goats be seen anywhere near the farms. His eyes travel to his goats, nosing about, attempting to wrest nutrition from minute greenery peeping out of the rock and dry earth. So we get the theme of corruption already been a part of Indian society since ages. The foreigner followed his look and decided that it would be a sound policy to show an interest in the old man's pets. He went up casually to them, struck their backs with every show of courteous attention. Now the truth dawned on him. His dream of a lifetime was about to be realized. He understood that the red man was actually making an offer for the goats. He had reared them up in the hope of selling them someday and with the capital opening a small shop on this very spot. Sitting here watching towards the hills, he had often dreamt how he would put up a thatched roof here, spread a gunny sack out on the ground and display on it fried nuts, colored sweets and green coconut for the thirsty and famished wayfarers on the highway, which was sometimes very busy. The animals were not prized ones for a cattle show, but he had spent his occasional savings to provide them some fancy diets now and then, and they did, did not look too bad. While he was reflecting thus, the red man shook his <coughs> hand and left on his palm 100 rupees in tents now, suddenly realizing that this was what the old man was asking. It's all for you or you may share it if you have a partner. So he stops the old man by shoving away the money. The old man pointed to the station wagon and said, Are you carrying them and off in the, that? Yes, of course, said the other, understanding the transportation part of it. The old man said, This will be their first ride in a motor car. Carry them off after I get out of the sight. Otherwise, they will never follow you. But only me, even if I'm traveling on the path to Yamaloka. So it shows that Muni is well read about mythology and Yama is known as the god of death. He laughed at his own joke, brought his palms together in a salute, turned round and went off and was soon out of the sight beyond a clump of thicket. The red man looked at the goats grazing peacefully perched on the pedestal of the horse and as the westerly sun touched off the ancient faded colors of the statue with a fresh splendor. He ruminated, he must have, he must be gone to fetch some help, I suppose, and settled down to wait. When a truck came downhill, he stopped it and got the help of a couple of men to detach the horse from its pedestal and place it in a station wagon. He gave them five rupees each, and for a farther payment, they siphoned off gas from the tar truck and helped him to start the engine. So this Muni never returned and that is why uh, the foreigner had to take the help of the men from the tar truck, gave them, gave them five rupees and of course just started his engine. Muni hurried homewards with the cash securely tucked away at his waist in the dhoti. 
He shut the street door and stole up softly to his wife as she squatted before the lit oven, wondering if by a miracle food would drop from the sky. When he displayed his fortune for the day, she snatched the notes from him, counted them like the glow of the fire and cried 100 rupees. How did you come by it? Have you been stealing? I have sold our goats to a red-faced man. He was absolutely crazy to have them. Gave me all this money and carried them off in his motor car. Hardly had these words left his lips when they heard bleating outside. So he told a different version of story to his wife that he had sold the goats to the man. But just then, the goats had come, this bleating. So this and the end of the story comes as a surprise to us. It comes as something which was totally unexpected by us. The character of the wife who is utterly honest, who will not even support her husband even if the police takes him away. And also how like everyone is not everyone is left amazed, but everyone just takes the fun element of the story. He muttered a great curse and seized one of the goats by its ears and shouted, Where is that man? Don't you know you are his? Why did you come back? The goat only wriggled at his grief. He asked the same question of the other two. The goat shook itself off. His wife glared at him and declared, If you have thieved, the police will come tonight and break your bones. Don't involve me. I will go away to my parents. So with this note, the story ends. Where comes a surprising, surprising end to the story. The story is indeed one of the characteristic styles, exhibits one of the characteristic styles that Arkinaran follows in all of his stories. So with that note, let us end the class right here. Hope you will find the story interesting and of course get in between the lines to understand the story better. Do comments, your doubts, your feedbacks which is very important to keep this channel growing. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.